Assalamu alaikum, bismillah, wa salatu, wa salamu alayh, ala rasulillah. So today we're going to talk about the Ayyubids, i.e. Salahuddin al-Ayyubi, and of course naturally that will include the Crusades. Um, this recorded lecture is kind of part of the curriculum for this week, but really what I would like for you to focus on is uh, the film the kingdom of heaven because it's considered the most historically accurate uh, Hollywood movie ever made about the Crusades and it also gives you a sense that if you pay close attention to the film um, that not all of the European factions who participated in the Crusades had the same ideas about the Crusades. You had the kind of more traditional, um, boy, what are those guys called? Uh, 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 Knights Templar, who you see in white, um, who Duchetion is a big, uh, I guess you could say leader. So if you watch the movie Duchetion, he's uh, got an uh, orange beard, he gets imprisoned, um, he's the one that killed Salahuddin's sister. Um, and then you also had the hospitalers who uh, wore more like uh, black color uniforms, if I remember correctly. And then you had just various other Europeans who kind of get caught in the mix. You have the king of Jerusalem. You also have uh, Byzantium uh, kind of uh, not... So Byzantium didn't know what to do with these crusaders. These crusaders came from Western Europe and they asked permission to pass through Byzantium, i.e. Uh, Constantinople, and they reluctantly let them through. They almost didn't let them enter Byzantine territory because they didn't know who these ruffians and hooligans were. Um, but then eventually they actually sent some uh, forces to accompany um, the crusaders. Um, and the crusaders, as they went through Europe, massacred all kinds of people so they massacred many other europeans as well as jews in europe which you can google and, and learn more about it's beyond kind of the the scope of this class because this class is about islamic history and not european history and this is the eighth lecture in our series so we're already three-fourths the way done um with this class Ahlan wa sahlan, assalamu alaikum ya tullab al Like I mentioned before, this is predominantly going to focus on Salahuddin Ayyubi. And there's this quote from him, how can I smile? How can food and drink taste good when Masjid al-Aqsa is in the hands of the Crusaders? And there are two really good books that I want to bring to your attention on uh, the Crusades in particular. You have first this one from Amin Ma'aluf, Ma and um, it's called The Crusades Through Arab Eyes. That gives you kind of just the perspective on the Crusades as shown by Islamic historians in the pre-modern period. And then of course, um, you have this book, a more recent one by Paul Cobb, where Paul Cobb, he really draws heavily on Islamic sources to do his history and it's one of the more fair and objective uh, histories of the Crusades that uh, isn't so Eurocentric it's more balanced and so by reading those two books in tandem they call it synto syntoptic reading or syntoptical reading which is a word you can google um, you get a clearer understanding uh, as to what actually happened. And of course, you can look at uh, primary historical sources too, if you'd like, but if you just want a quick overview of these two books read together, um, really el elucidate the history of the Crusades from the Islamic perspective. And so of course, we're gonna have to talk a little bit of uh, Yusuf bin Ayyub bin Shadi. 
um, who uh, he was started out as a military commander under Nuruddin Zengi, under the Zengids, and um, then rose to prominence as the uh, leader of the opposition to the Crusades, right? And so uh, Paul Cobb, in the book I just mentioned, he says, his is a remarkable story, one of a meritoric, meritoric rise from humble beginnings. So we know that um, Salahuddin was a Kurd who didn't necessarily have any prominent lineage or prominent background. He probably grew up quite poor and just an average citizen of Kurdistan. Though he came to rule as Sultan of the Ayyubid dynasty of Egypt and Syria, Salahuddin started out as an ordinary Kurdish soldier in the army of a local potentate in Syria, Nuruddin Zengi. He grew up to become the most powerful military leader of his day, legendary for his victory at the Battle of Hattin in 1187. And keep in mind that Imam Ghazali died in 1111. So 1187 that allowed him to retake Jerusalem and much of Palestine after nearly a century of crusader occupation. In both the Middle East and the West, he remains admired, a symbol of statemanship and chivalry. And this is shown in the film, The Kingdom of Heaven. The chivalry of Salahuddin is highly emphasized in that film. Chivalry sometimes gets translated from muru'a, Muru'a, it comes from the word for human being. Um, human being is al mar'u in Arabic, uh, woman imra'a, so it has that same root. And um, you also have the very popular name imru qais, imru al qais, which also comes from that same root. And then derived from it is muru'a. So muru'a. In a sense, you could say it's humanism. It's human, you know, uh, but the Arab pre-modern form of it, or chivalry. Chivalry comes from French. Chevalier is knight in French. So cavalier comes from that French word. It refers to someone who is part of the cavalry. Uh, i.e. a knight, someone who rode a horse, was fully armored. They usually came from the wealthy upper classes. Um, and they did that as, uh, it was kind of the most protected uh, way of fighting. <laughs> so the privileged people engaged in that because they weren't going to be slaughtered like the masses. And essentially they were the tanks of their day, the cavalry, these heavily armored knights riding armored horses into battle with uh, longer weapons, long swords, spears, that type of thing, where they could kill people without, uh, with while having distance from them, so they were less likely to be killed. Um, you know, their thick armor allowed, uh, you know, arrows to be deflected away from them. Essentially, they were the elites doing what elites do, taking full advantage of their privilege. And so that's just something to keep in mind that the difference in Arabic chivalry and European chivalry is a big one. And Cobb goes on to say, the Crusades are not a noble European adventure, but a savage attack by a fanatical, intolerant, and hypocritical Christian West. A precursor to European colonialism, also a precursor to the Inquisition, that's another story. So inflicted upon a hapless Islamic East, sublimely supine in its high civilization of tolerance, wisdom, caught unawares by what one historian suggested could be called the last of the barbarian invasions. To most people in the East and the West, this is what the Crusades mean today. Osama bin Laden, an extreme version, saw the world he operated in as divided between Muslims and a global crusading movement directed against them. And sorry to say, but Osama bin Laden had a point there because George Bush, he used the word crusades in terms of invading Afghanistan and Iraq. Although, of course, Osama bin Laden himself and what Al-Qaeda espoused was Kharaji theology. That is someone who is a 
major sinner, a fasiq is a disbeliever according to Al-Qaeda. And so they, they left Sunni theology in that, in that regard. And then Cobb goes on to say, it is in its clumsiness, this view has much in common with the triumphal narrative it supposedly replaced. Meaning the crusaders who said, you know, kill the infidel, it's the ticket to heaven. As you'll see in the film, The uh, Kingdom of Heaven. And I also wanted to make you aware of the top Arab historians on the Crusades in case you read Arabic or someday you'll be able to read uh, Arabic. Um, they're the contemporary researchers or experts on um, this topic and they both have recently passed away. Rahimahumullah Al-Marhuman Saeed Abdul Futah Ashur and Suhail Zakkar. And so going back to Saeed Abd Abdul Futah Ashur, Al Ustad, so his father was Dr. Abdul Abdul Futah Ashur, who was a professor in Darul Ulum, Cairo University. So his father had a great influence in shaping his personality, and by being the son of a prominent university professor, the historian Ashur is the author of more than 22 books on the history of the Middle Ages in Europe and the Arab Islamic Levant. He published many scientific papers and articles, and he chaired and worked as a professor of the medieval chair for several decades in the history department of Arab universities such as Cairo University, Beirut Arab University, Kuwait University, Baghdad University, Mosul University, Algiers University, Sultan Qaboos University, Cambridge University, and others. So very uh, illuminous career. He lectured and supervised research and worked as a visiting professor in many Egyptian, Arab, and British universities. Arab historians unanimously agreed and in their great uh, conference held in 1991 in Cairo to elect him as head of the Union of Arab Historians of Egypt, a position he held unanimously uh, by the members who called him Sheikh of the Arab historian Sheikh al muarakhin until he retired due to health conditions in 2005. Suhail Zakkar believed that whoever works in the history of Arabs and Islam must master three basic arts, investigation, bahth, translation, tarjima, and authorship. The investigation of the history of Arabs and Islam graduates in a scientific way from the schools of Arab historians like Ibn Ishaq, Ibn al-Jawzi, al-Zuhri, Khalifa bin Khayyot, al-Baladuri, Ibn Hubaysh, and the last of them he says is Ibn Kathir. He also confirms that translation is essential in the work of the historian, and it is necessary to look at sources other than Arabic. Since the, since the establishment of Islam, there have been very useful sources other than Arabic written in Syriac, Armenian, Greek, etc. And so the importance of non-Arabic uh, sources is, is, you know, it increases, is very, very important as we're recognizing over time. In his view, this is self-evident because no event in history was limited to a limited area of the earth, but rather extended to the whole world. And that's an important point. Every historical event has ripple effects that affects the whole world or is part of a larger global trend. And according to Arab historians, the Crusades began earlier than what European historians say. And so Cobb says, to take one obvious example, the medieval Islamic sources, like the medieval Christian sources for that matter, never refer to these events as Crusades nor such word exists in classical Arabic. And the Arabic term for the Crusades in use today, al-Hurub al-Salibiyya, is a modern neologism. Sulub means crosses. So it's kind of like saying the, the, the crosses, the cross wars, you, you might even say, or the Christian wars maybe. Nor do the Arabic sources see these events as commencing with Pope Urban II's speech in 1095 and ending with the expulsion of the last crusaders from the city of Aqr in 1291, as in the traditional narrative. To them, the invasion of the Levant 
associated with the First Crusade was simply one of outburst of European aggression that began decades earlier in the 11th century in Spain and Sicily. This surge would later extend to Turkey, Iraq, Syria, Palestine, I think he means Sham by that, Egypt, the Mediterranean islands, and even Arabia, and then direct its attention towards the Mediterranean and Eastern Europe. Prognostication and the Crusades. So if you've ever heard the word prognosis, that's where your doctor might tell you how many months you have to live, how long it'll take for your disease to be cured, etc., etc. Prognostication is basically a prediction into the future. So this is also from Cobb. He says, the first Frankish invasion of the Near East, we are told, were attended by the usual signs of cosmic foreboding. According to one story in circulation, a generation or so after the First Crusade, some workmen in the employ of Yerisian, the ill-fated governor of Antioch, discovered a covered stone basin during their repair work in the walls of the city, which had been damaged in an earthquake some years earlier. Peeking inside, they discovered a group of brass figurines of mysterious horsemen each dressed in a long coat of chain mail, grasping a shield and spear. Puzzled, the emir asked a group of the local city elders, native Christians, what they thought of these, figure, these figures could represent. The elders too were stumped. They didn't know, they said, but the figurines reminded them of something that took place many years before, when the city was still in Byzantine hands. In 1084, the walls of a local monastery had collapsed, and during the reconstruction work, they discovered a similar stone basin containing brass figurines of horsemen bearing bows and arrows, which they easily identified as Turks. They thought little of the discovery, little that is, until a short time later when an army of precisely these sorts of horsemen, the Seljuk Turks, captured the city and subjected it to decades of Turkish rule. Perhaps the elders meekly suggested to the emir that these strange new figurines in chain mail represented some other conquering nation still unknown to Antioch. Yerisian merely scoffed at them. Snorting in disbelief that there were any other infidels left to be worried about, alas. And as we might have predicted a short time later, word arrived that the Franks, some doubtless clad in long coats of chain mail had encamped before Constantinople en route to Yerisian's date with destiny. Another good story, the tale succeeds in explaining the catastrophic loss of Antioch to the Franks as ineluctable faded from the first, showing that the conquest of the city by the Franks, just like its conquest by the Turks, had been decreed long before in the legendary age of the city's founding. And so, whether you believe in these prophecies or prognostications or you know or not, um, it's clear that you know later historians and later sources they wanted to symbolize the Crusades, i.e., put it into language and into stories to try to make sense of the mindless violence, and that's why I'm having you look at Ibn Barrajan's uh, prognostication, which I do believe was true and actually did have. I mean. Factually, it was written down before the Crusades happened and did predict pretty accurately um, the conquest of Quds. You know, uh, it's, it's very interesting to look at that stuff and how it's received and understood by later peoples. So what was going on in Europe? Why did the Europeans want to somehow come to the east and then suddenly take Jerusalem? Well, the Crusades had their origin in a general European counterattack against Muslim powers in the Mediterranean. And by the way, this passage is from um, Ira Lapidus's book that I've assigned to you. So the Crusades had their origin in a general European counterattack against Muslim powers in the Mediterranean. Italian towns were pushing back Muslim pirates. Actually, the Muslims uh, had conquered all of southern Italy at one point. And... Uh, you know, like the story of Jack Sparrow, we had many Muslim pirates in our history, 
and um, this was a major problem in the medieval period for southern France, uh, northern Spain, and Italy. They were constantly being attacked by Muslim pirates who were themselves independent of any Muslim state, um, allegedly. That's still debated. Um, but so they were constantly um, attacking or pirating, uh, whoa, pillaging, you might say, monasteries in Italy, southern France, and northern Spain, which was still under Christian control. Um, and it made the Europeans, the Western Europeans, very uh, afraid. And at the same time, you had these Viking barbarians from Scandinavia attacking England, attacking Scotland, attacking Ireland, even attacking Islamic Spain itself. And they were they also conquered France and became the Normans from Norse men, right? The northern men, Normans, i.e. the Vikings. And all of this is featured in the, the, the TV show that's a historical fiction called Vikings, right? Very famous TV show. Um, and so basically Western Europe was being outflanked by two sides. The two the, from the south were coming the Muslims, from the north were coming the Vikings, and they felt like they were in a vice grip. They were being squeezed, right? They didn't know what to do. They were fighting and trying to go down to fight the Muslims in Spain. Couldn't make any gains, right? And so the Pope was freaking out. The Pope was kind of like the figurehead for all of Europe. They all kind of united under the Pope. This was really before Protestantism. And the Pope was trying to figure out, okay, how can we keep morale going? How can we save face as we're highly embarrassed by it? these pagans attacking us from the north and these Muslims, Saracens attacking us from the south. How do we save face? How do we keep our dignity when Christendom seemed entirely threatened? Right? Not to mention the uh, northern steppe peoples who were attacking through Eastern Europe, you know, Byzantium and all this and that. Um, so there was a reconquista that begun in Spain, as we know, and um, the Norm Normans, who were these Vikings, conquered Sicily, took that away from the Muslims. And um, the papacy was eager to reconcile the Greek and Western churches. So the Pope wanted to unite Byzantium with uh, Western Rome. So you had Western Roman Empire, Eastern Roman Empire. Byzantium was the Eastern Roman Empire. So the Pope in uh, uh, Italy represented the Western Roman Empire. He wanted to unite them again, um, try to bring some sort of Christian unity in order to fight against these external threats. And so he wanted to support the Byzantium against the Seljuk Turks who were uh, causing them problems in, in Anatolia. Right, and he wanted to establish new states in the Eastern Mediterranean as a buffer, right, and to spread the influence of the church, right, especially the the Latin speaking, you know, Catholic Church amongst the Eastern Orthodox Christians, right. So he had kind of both motivations there, and also there was a, a Christians had a strong passion for pilgrimage to the holy site to Quds, to Jerusalem. 11th century Christian feeling stressed penance and the quest for remission of sins. So the way you got your sins forgiven was through penance, through some sort of physical act, right? Whether it be self-flagellation or um, fighting for your religion, sort of like jihad, fisa bidi that, right? And um, Jerusalem, the heavenly city, symbolized salvation. The Seljuk invasions raised European anxieties about access to Jerusalem because they felt that, you know, the Muslim world is unstable. You had the, the Shi'i century with all of its different polities. And then now, all of a sudden, these Seljuk Turks came out of nowhere, completely dismantled the Shi'i century, and 
the Muslim world looks like it's an internal chaos. And they were worried, are we still going to have access to do pilgrimage to Jerusalem? And so all of these kind of trends came together in 1096, where Pope Urban II, he spoke to this audience of warriors in southern France um, and basically convinced them to do an armed pilgrimage to capture holy places from the infidels. So whoever killed an infidel got a ticket to heaven is kind of one of the sayings that went on. So those who would undertake this mission, Urban offered protection of property at home, new lands, Ghanima, basically, war booty in the east, plenary indulgences, which was forgiveness of sins, and the total remission of all temporal punishments that might be imposed by the church for the commission of past sins. So you could get basically your criminal record wiped clean. And if you see in the movie, The Kingdom of Heaven, the main character um, played by, I think that's Orlando Bloom. Anyways, he, uh, I don't know, I'm not into pop culture much. <laughs> um, you'll see that he um, murders a priest. And he joins the crusade simply as a way to um, get that his criminal record wiped clean, right? Um, you know, that the, the commission of past sins will be forgiven by the church um, if he takes up the crusades. And at the same time, his father was a crusader, his long lost father, who he just kind of reconnected with quite randomly. Um, so all of that was the impetus for him to join the Crusades. And so basically the culture in Europe was that you would have a promise of absolution from sins and you would have salvation if you went and crusaded against the Saracens. So this was the milieu that was happening in Europe and, the, and this was spurred by the Muslim en encroachment on Western Europe that they decided we can't fight them in the West, we're gonna go fight them in the East. And the Ayyubids won. As we know, they, they won against the Crusaders and they established their own uh, Sultanate or dynasty or Khilafah if you prefer, over uh, the Muslim lands. They toppled the Faltimids who were inept against the Crusaders. And they ruled, um, this area known as Al Jazeera, which is between these two uh, rivers here, um, the Euphrates and Tigris, as well as Sham, naturally, from the Crusades, the Hejaz, and down to Yemen, and much of Egypt with uh, Tunis and Libya, you know, all these kind of areas here in North Africa as well. So they had quite the dynasty, um, the the pink is just kind of showing that's where like uh, these crusader kingdoms were at one point but the the ayubids did have control over that area um and this is al-bahar al-mutawasit the mediterranean sea al-bahar al-ahmar the uh, red red sea there and this is the uh sahara desert and you can see much of anatolia is still kind of more or less under Byz byzantine control although the there were city-states ruled by Seljuk still in Anatolia, which is not shown here, unfortunately. Many of these islands were at one point ruled by Muslims, but then they were lost. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind as well, as Europe felt we were enclosing upon them. And uh, the conquest of Egypt by Salahuddin in 1171 opened the way for the installation of the Sunni schools in Egypt. The Shafi'i school had survived under Fatimid rule, which the Shafi'i school had been the dominant school in Egypt since Imam Shafi'i settled there. And Salahuddin, he introduced the Hanafi school endowed by colleges of law, madrasas, and uh, recruited prominent teachers and judges from abroad. So he brought ulama to Egypt and uh, Sham by the early 13th century, the Ayyubid government in Egypt adopted a pan-Sunni policy of equal recognition and equal sponsorship of all schools of law, or madhahib. Um, 
although the main ones recognized were Hanafi, Maliki, and Shafi'i, the Hanbalis were so small in number they were not on anybody's radar. So you, in, you had the Dar al Hadith al Kamila, al Kamaliya, sorry, Dar al Hadith al Kamaliya, which was a madrasa founded in 1222 to teach points of law that were held in common among the schools. The Madrasa as Salahiyya was founded in 1239 to house all four schools of law in the same building. Upon in the Salahiyya from Salahuddin, right? Upon Salahuddin's death in 1193, his family, the Ayyubid house or clan, succeeded to rule Egypt uh, and Syria. And they ruled them basically until the Mamluk dynasty, which we'll get to later. The family divided his empire into smaller kingdoms of Egypt, Damascus, so basically city-states, Aleppo, Mosul, uh, in accordance with the Seljuk idea that the state was the patrimony of the royal family. Nonetheless, the Ayyubids did not revert to the fragmentation of earlier regimes. So even though they had these city-states, they were still quite unified, and maybe that's because of their Kurdic background. The Sultan of Egypt usually managed to assert his suzerainty over the rest of the family and make use of family loyalties to integrate the regime. The Ayyubids ailed Egypt and Syria through a military aristocracy composed of Kurdish and Turkish troops and slave soldiers who would become the Mamluks. Mamluk means slave or somebody that's owned. They administered Egypt by the age-old bureaucratic system that prevailed in that country and Syria by the distribution of feudal land, also known as Aqta, to the leading military officers. So that's the Ayyubids in a nutshell. In this lecture, like I said, it's going to be shorter because Part of the required curriculum here is that you watch the film The Kingdom of Heaven, which I did put on Canvas. I know it'll look a little pixelated and grainy, but in order to get the movie on Canvas, I had to, you know, make the file size uh, pretty small. So sorry, it's not HD, but um, I think you can rent it for like three bucks on Amazon Prime or what have you if, if you don't want to watch it all grainy. But anyways, that's it. So... I hope you enjoy the film, and I hope that you find the Ayyubids quite interesting and uh, Ibn Bararajan's prediction quite interesting.